is uh, uh, extend the theory that we have developed for the operation of nuclear reactors to uh, existing uh, nuclear reactor designs. Uh, obviously, you can build the nuclear reactor in the shape of a sphere, but nuclear reactors take the shape of a cylinder. Or for the Chicago Pi number one, there were pri uh, or the uh, the reactors at Hanford, they were pr uh, uh, practically in the shape of parity pi. So what we would like to do today is take the three-dimensional type of uh, actual practical design of nuclear power plants, uh, because some of you will be in fact operating, building, and even designing uh, the future uh, nuclear power plants. So from that perspective, we move uh, in sharing to uh, the chapter on three-dimensional or multi-dimensional reactor systems. And we are going to still use diffusion uh, theory. Uh, however, we are, going, we are going to encounter a little difficulty here, but uh, that may be a, is a, a, a blessing for uh, many of you uh, who should graduate learning about partial differential equations, because once we deal uh, with three-dimensional reactors like the spherical geometry, we find ourselves not dealing with the uh, ordinary differential equation for the solution of the flux or the power distribution, uh, but we are dealing now with a partial differential equation. So we're going to learn uh, in that uh, in today's uh, lecture uh, how to solve uh, for an actual reactor system. Uh, unfortunately, in the textbooks on nuclear energy, uh, I will mention, for instance, the Lamarche textbook, uh, you'll find that they uh, uh, deal with uh, geometries of nuclear reactors that are totally, totally unrealistic. For instance, they take a reparity pied and they take it only in the X dimension. Uh, and then in the Z and Y dimensions, they take it as an infinite reactor, which doesn't exist in nature. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so that is, would be the geometry of what is they call the slab reactor and solve the system uh, in a very unrealistic way. So today we are going to deal with realistic uh, shapes for nuclear reactors. There is a theory underlying the solution in that case for partial differential equations in terms of orthogonal or orthonormal functions, but I'm going to bypass this and uh, directly uh, deal with the uh, three-dimensional reactors. Uh, this is the simplest uh, geometry here. That would be a parapipide core, meaning that it is uh, uh, in the form of a parapipide. Let's look at uh, the geometry here uh, in the X, Y, and Z uh, direction. So that's a three-dimensional shape for a nuclear reactor. And the special case of it is when the side lengths are equal, oh, then we get a cube, a reactor in the shape of the cube. And you'll see later uh, at the end of the chapter that the criticality uh, of the three-dimensional reactors depend on the geometry. And uh, we'll see that the sphere that we have already solved in the previous chapter uh, uh, gives us the minimum uh, critical mass because this is a geometrical property of the sphere is that its surface to volume ratio is the least in all the known geometries. So the leakage, the term of leakage in the diffusion equation or the Helmholtz equation uh, uh, provides a less leakage. If we deal with a, a parapipide, uh, then we have to take into account the X dimension, uh, the Y dimension, the Z dimension, and we get basically the Laplacian in that case is a second uh, derivative with respect to X of the flux. Remember, we are dealing with the flux as a scalar quantity from it. We can get the current by applying a fixed law and the uh, leakage term uh, that is described by the buckling, the geometric buckling in that case uh, is three terms, uh, uh, partial derivatives, uh, second partial derivative in the X dimension, Y dimension, and Z uh, dimension. And uh, the solution for a partial differential equation like this uh, is an art in solving really differential equations. So we are going to bypass the uh, Cartesian geometry and go directly to an actual reactor design, which would be uh, the 
cylindrical geometry, but uh, the same ideas and same methodologies apply, then that's a method of basically uh, separation of the variable. So let's go to the cylindrical geometry, which is the geometry uh, for a uh, actual uh, power plant. Uh, the piping and uh, uh, equipment, the uh, control rods being, of course, long rods, impose on us that cylindrical uh, geometry. Uh, so uh, that's what we start with, the finite height cylindrical core. And the Laplacian in that case, as you could see, is has a partial derivative with respect to the z dimension, the height of the cylinder, and uh, another uh, partial term, derivative term, the Laplacian, and the radial dimension. So the geometry in that case is shown here. Uh, you have a cylinder with the origin of the coordinates at the center of the uh, cylinder. The cylinder has a radius capital R and has a height uh, H. Uh, H prime because we consider the extrapolation lengths where the neutrons leak a little bit beyond the surface of the reactor. This is a realistic form for uh, existing nuclear power plants. And since some of you will be designing, building, and operating nuclear power plants, we'd like to uh, consider that particular case. And notice here that the Laplacian uh, in cylindrical geometry has uh, two terms. And uh, this is a partial differential equation. And uh, uh, our illustrious mathematicians spent uh, lifetimes and whole careers uh, showing us how to solve those partial differential equations. Uh, we are engineers here. So in that case, we will adopt the solutions that they provide for us. But then we'll keep in mind that when we apply the boundary conditions, uh, we only are going to deal with real life practical problems. So as I said earlier, uh, uh, engineers are really uh, uh, applied mathematicians, so to say. Uh, the method is called the method of separation of variable. And uh, if I know that the flux or consequently the power is going to be a function of both the radial dimension in the cylinder as well as the height, then I can separate that phi, that's a function of both r and z, into the product of two functions. One, r sub r, a function that's only a function of r and another function that's only a function of z. Uh, notice that in the textbooks, uh, like take Lamarche, for instance, uh, they consider a cylinder that is semi-infinite, meaning that the infinite doesn't have a finite height. It goes to infinity in the z direction and to minus infinity in the z direction. And then they solve uh, for the flux distribution in that case. That is not practical. and. Uh, uh, they didn't just try to go the extra step that we are going to today. Uh, once you get this uh, product of two functions, you can substitute uh, that new uh, separable function, uh, separable solution into the partial differential equation. So let's take, for instance, the second term here, uh, d partial phi by dz squared. When we take the second derivative of that function of r and z with respect to z, uh, the R uh, function uh, basically uh, acts as a constant. So we end up with uh, the R of Z uh, and we end up with the, the second derivative with respect to Z of uh, Z, capital Z, the function of Z. Uh, the same applies for the radial uh, part of the Laplacian here. Uh, in that case, we get one over R again, uh, and then we end up with D r by dr uh, uh, multiplied into r, and we take the derivative with respect uh, to r. Uh, uh, you'll find that in that case, the z uh, is, acts as a constant. Uh, then we go and divide into r z. So you'll find that uh, here, uh, in that case, the r cancels out. The z remains in the second term here, and uh, the 1 over r remains in the first term. Let's take the second term first. The second term is uh, a term that uh, we can deal with separately. Uh, we take one over z, d square, z by dz square is equal to minus a constant minus delta square. And notice here that once I do this, that expression here is only a function of z because z is a function of z only. So in that case, I'm entitled to say that 
that is not a partial derivative anymore. This is a total derivative. So I have uh, basically changed one part of the differential equation from being a partial differential equation into a, an ordinary differential equation. And look at this. If you take d squared z by dz squared uh, and take the z to that side minus delta squared z, oh, well, uh, that reminds us again uh, with, uh, uh, it reminds us of the uh, partial with the ordinary differential equation, the x double dot is equal to minus omega square x, the simple harmonic oscillator. And notice that it has a negative sign here. And that negative sign implies a harmonic solution or a cosine plus C sine solution in the Z direction. So the flux, the neutron flux in the Z dimension is a, a cosine plus C sine. And in fact, uh, this is a, a, a correct mathematical uh, solution. But as engineers, uh, we uh, know that we cannot get a zero flux at the center. Uh, and the sine curve would uh, get a zero at the center. So immediately, we drop the C, capital C here, as being an impractical, not real life solution. And you find that our flux in the Z direction is really takes the shape of a cosine. So in the cosine uh, in the uh, cylinder that you are dealing with, you find that you have a cosine that covers the reactor. It peaks at the center and reaches zero uh, beyond the boundaries at the height of the cylinder uh, and the bottom of the cylinder. Uh, it is a little more difficult uh, to consider that second term here, the radial part of the Laplacian. Uh, in the same way, we equate it to a constant here, minus gamma squared. And in that case, minus delta squared uh, and minus gamma square should be equal to minus the buckling square, where we can say that the geometric buckling B square should be equal to gamma square plus delta uh, square. And uh, later on, we'll give a physical meaning to the buckling. You'll find that the buckling uh, uh, physically represents the leakage uh, for, of the neutrons uh, in the case of Z from the top and the bottom of the reactor. And the gamma uh, or the geometric buckling in the R dimension represents the uh, leakage of the neutron from the surface of the reactor uh, over the radial uh, uh, surface. Notice also that uh, once we made that substitution here, uh, you'll find that that partial derivative here turns immediately into a, a total derivative because uh, obviously the, uh, uh, the R here, that whole term is only a function of R. So we are entitled to replace the partial derivative with the total derivative. Now, this equation here is an equation that all engineers uh, deal with eventually uh, during their careers. If you haven't seen it before, uh, here uh, we see it. But uh, say if you are an electrical engineer and you are dealing with an antenna, in the shape of a cylinder, like the cylinder geometry we are dealing with today, who you run into that equation. And the solution in that case would be the same uh, for the antenna almost, uh, or the shape of the solution as it is for the shape of uh, the flux or the power in a nuclear reactor. If you are doing heat transfer, a chemical, mechanical engineer, civil engineer, uh, any cylindrical shape uh, will give you that uh, second derivative in the uh, Laplacian. Now that uh, interesting uh, term here is uh, uh, definitely very uh, interesting. So let's uh, expand on it a little bit more. We'll come back to the other term later on. Uh, the equation for that R uh, can be rewritten as two terms, d square R by dr square. Uh, how do we do this? Just to take uh, those derivatives. If you take those derivatives here, uh, d by dr, r d by dr, divide it to one over r, then divide back into r. Apply the chain rule of differentiation here. So you have d by dr, the first term by the derivative of the second, plus the second term by the derivative of the first. Uh, you can rewrite that equation in uh, another form that is uh, more familiar uh, to uh, people in general in the engineering and physics field. Uh, it looks like this. So this is uh, the form of the equation now, d square r by dr square plus one over r dr uh, partial, uh, not partial, uh, total derivative by dr, and that's minus uh, gamma square r. Again, you notice it, it looks much like 
the x double dot is equal to minus omega square x, except that it is not just x double dot, there is also an x dot appearing here. And uh, that equation is a very famous equation in mathematical physics and in engineering and uh, in all fields of science. And that equation takes a very general form. And uh, it takes that form here, general form, x squared, d squared y by dx squared plus x dy by dx plus x squared minus n squared y. Uh, in any field of engineering, once you have a cylindrical geometry, sooner or later you run into that equation. Uh, that equation was uh, analyzed by a German mathematician and astronomer, uh, Frederick Bessel. Uh, he lived from 1784 to 1846, and he was uh, studying uh, planetary motions, and he came up uh, in it, and in modern engineering practice, it is encountered whenever a cylindrical geometry arises in any engineering analysis. So that equation is so famous, we call it the Bessel equation. And uh, that N here makes the equation, Bessel equation named Bessel equation of order N. The solution for that equation is a function that uh, uh, looks like uh, the uh, harmonic functions, the cosine and the sine, except that now it's a solution in terms of two new uh, 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 functions. Uh, J sub N is called the Bessel function of the first kind of order N. And uh, the second solution uh, that, that looks like the cosine, in fact, uh, is the y sub n. Uh, the y sub n is called the Bessel function of the second kind of order n. And uh, it's also named in some uh, uh, sources as the Neumann uh, function. And we have two concepts of integration, capital E here and capital F right here. Obviously, uh, in our equation, our n is, uh, is zero. So we have a simpler form of the Bessel equation. We'll deal with the Bessel function of the Bessel uh, of the first kind of order zero. So that would be J sub zero. And here we will deal with Y sub zero as a Bessel function of the second order of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, order uh, N. Uh, if we have uh, uh, just uh, for the sake of completeness and learning about Bessel functions, if we have a positive sign here, in front of the n squared rather than a, a negative sign. Uh, the solution uh, in the same way that we had the hyperbolic cosine and the hyperbolic sine come in when we had the equation as x double dot is equal to plus omega square x, you find that you get the solution in terms of two other Bessel functions. Uh, I sub n here is a modif it's called the modified Bessel function of the first kind of order n. And the case of n here is called the modified Bessel function of the second order of order n. Let's look at how those functions uh, look like. And uh, uh, the interesting thing is first, definitely, let me uh, fill up the page with the uh, graph here. Uh, let's look first at the J sub zero or the Bessel function of the first kind of zeros order. Look uh, how that function behaves. Uh, it starts at one here, then it decreases in magnitude, follow the arrow, uh, and then it hits the x axis here. So that's its first root or its first zero at a value of 2.405. It's almost a value as important as pi uh, in other applications. So look here at zero here. If you go down here, you read that it is at two uh, here, 2.405. So the first root or the first zero of the Bessel function of the uh, first kind of zero, uh, zeros order hits the x-axis at 2.405. And then it starts fluctuating very much like the cosine function and very much like in the case of the spherical geometry when we solved for the flux and the power uh, uh, in a spherical geometry like the sine r over r. So sine r over r, if you plot it and you plot a cosine and you plot the Bessel function, you find that they're close to each other, but not exactly uh, the same. Uh, the zeros uh, function here, like the cosine, fluctuates around uh, the uh, x uh, axis, but with decreasing magnitude. You see the magnitude here is one, 
uh, when it goes to uh, the negative part, the maximum value is minus 0.4, and then it increases. It behaves like the cosine, but with decreasing magnitude. And that comes from the property of the cylinder in that as uh, you move away from the center uh, for the same thickness, you'll have larger and larger volume. So whatever temperature or energy it distributes itself in a larger uh, volume. So the fascinating thing then is that if we take only the main harmonic of the solution uh, for the Bessel function, we'll get that J sub zero. Just for completeness, uh, we found that the first solution, the harmonic solution uh, for the Y sub zero, uh, it comes from minus infinity. Uh, it uh, really is a substitute for the uh, sine function in the uh, harmonic solution, A cosine plus sine. And uh, uh, you'll find that uh, you cannot have uh, a flux or a power uh, distribution in the nuclear reactor is minus infinity. So the term that uh, the constant associated with Y sub zero uh, is set for practical reasons uh, to uh, zero. Uh, so this uh, J naught and Y naught are really some kind, you can call them harmonic solutions to the Bessel equation. On the other hand, uh, the modified Bessel equation uh, corresponds to the hyperbolic sine and the hyperbolic cosine, shine and cosine curves when we have a positive sign in the simple harmonic oscillator solution. Uh, however, you'll find that the I sub zero, uh, let's say, let's look at the K sub zero, uh, it goes to infinity uh, uh, when uh, we are at X is equal to zero, and then it decreases uh, according to the value of the K note uh, and almost uh, looks very much like and to zero, it, it asymptotically goes to zero is the same way as we have the negative exponential. Uh, on the other hand, you'll find that the I sub zero uh, starts close to zero, little above zero and increases uh, almost like the increasing exponential. So there is an analogy, uh, but the geometry, uh, cylindrical geometry introduces to us uh, no uh, functions. Okay, let's go back to uh, the, our uh, uh, cylindrical uh, reactor uh, uh, design. And uh, we said now that we broke uh, the partial differential equation into two ordinary differential equation. One of them has a solution A cosine plus C sine. And the other solution here has a Bessel function because the zero here uh, 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 of the Bessel function of the first kind of zeros order uh, plus a Bessel function of the uh, second kind of also zeros uh, order. As this solution here, we know that is A cosine plus C sine. And we can say immediately that the C here is equal to zero because we cannot have a flux of zero at the center of the reactor. And uh, at the extra, remember this, this is a function of Z. So this is a function of the height of the cylinder. Uh, the boundary condition would be that at a height uh, on top of the react, the top of the reactor, the plus sign h, h prime over two, and the bottom part at negative h uh, prime over two, uh, the solution should be equal to zero. Uh, uh, the flux basically vanishes there, and that implies that the sign solution is uh, has to be dropped. The real solution in the z dimension is an a cosine uh, delta. Z. Remember, delta was a constant replacing the omega uh, square. Now, we are going to be interested in a steady state solution. Uh, that cosine curve, as you know, has it uh, fluctuates. As it fluctuates, uh, it has its zeros or roots, and uh, it occurs at n pi over 2. But we are going to deal only with the main harmonic. So my pi, my n here is going to be 1. Uh, the other harmonics appear, but only as a transient. So when you flip a switch, uh, uh, turning on the light, you get a short transient where all those harmonics would appear uh, uh, in the current and voltage, but the steady state uh, is really what we seek as a solution. So we take N here is equal to one, the two and the two cancel. And you find that that Delta here has to be equal to pi over the height H. And delta square would be uh, pi over h square. And uh, this would be the solution uh, for the flux in the z direction. So the flux in the z direction 
will start from the top to the bottom and takes the shape of a cosine curve. Wonderful. How about the radial curve? Uh, in the radial dimension, uh, we have the now the Bessel function solution with n is equal to zero. So the solution is the uh, uh, that uh, j sub zero here plus y sub zero. Definitely the flux and the power cannot be uh, uh, minus uh, at, at x equals zero, uh, b minus infinity. So again, as engineers and practical people, we say that the f here uh, doesn't present us with a real life or uh, uh, practical solution. So we drop the f and say it's equal to zero. And we have applied in that case two boundary uh, conditions, except that we still have to do something uh, after dropping the f for the y sub zero function here, which is not practical, we are left with the j sub zero function. What is the value of gamma? And uh, in the same way that we said, uh, the cosine uh, gets its zeros at pi over two, three pi over two, uh, you'll find here that for j sub zero, uh, that value is 2.405 uh, 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 as the first group of the j sub zero function of the Bessel function of the first kind of zeros uh, order. And uh, in that case, you'll find that uh, when we write the uh, expression for the solution in the radial dimension, and now it's e sub z a is, uh, uh, e, a constant of integration, j sub zero, and instead of pi r over a prime, uh, we have now, instead of pi, we have 2.405. That's the numbers that uh, we need to some kind of engineers remember in the same way that we remember the value of pi, pi being 3.14159, uh, the best, the first zero of the Bessel function is 2.405. All right, so now we have a solution in the z dimension, uh, cosine pi z over h prime, and we have a solution in the r dimension, j sub zero, 2.405 instead of pi, uh, r divided into uh, a prime, which is the height uh, uh, the uh, the radius of the extrapolated radius of the cylinder, and we have said that uh, that 2.405 uh, uh, divided into a prime squared plus the value of pi over h uh, squared uh, represents really the constant of uh, uh, that are uh, equal to the geometric buckling. So the geometric buckling was defined as delta squared plus gamma squared, but not any delta squared. It's the first harmonic. So that's pi over h squared. And the second one is 2.405 over a squared. Uh, this uh, geometric buckling has a physical meaning because that term here represents the leakage term when we derived the Helmholtz equation or the neutron diffusion equation. And uh, it represents the, really the leakage at the top of the reactor and at the bottom of the reactor. Whereas this term here, the geometric buckling square uh, represents a leakage from the z dimension. So the sum of them represents the leakage from the whole surface of the uh, reactor. And what is the flux now or the power distribution? Now we have it a, a, a phi as a function of r, uh, the radial uh, dimension, and z, uh, the height of the uh, cylinder. And uh, uh, this is uh, a j naught cosine pi z over h prime. In the existing textbooks, unfortunately, uh, they consider the fictitious or unrealistic situation of a semi-infinite cylinder, a cylinder that goes to infinity and goes down to in, uh, down uh, in the negative z direction to infinity, and they give the solution as just that j sub zero with an associated uh, buckling. So I'll show you how these solutions are shown uh, in that case, but this is a realistic solution where the finite cylinder have a cosine distribution of the flux. Notice that uh, the flux reaches now its, uh, its maximum at the center uh, of the core of the cylindrical core. And that means that engineering wise, we have to account for the higher power level at the center of the core of the reactor, both from the perspective of the thermodynamics or the heat transfer. Uh, in that case, uh, because more power is produced at the center of the reactor, we have to use nozzles for directing the flow, whether it's the water in the BWR or uh, in, uh, in the P 
TWR or the boiling water reactor, we need nozzles. We have to allow the flow, uh, the mass flow rate to be higher near the center of the reactor where more heat is being generated. Not only that, but also from the materials perspective, uh, the fuel management, you'll find that as you produce more power near the center, uh, you are also going to burn more fuel near the center. So after a year and a half, uh, uh, the fuel is shuffled in the reactor. Uh, that is a, a, a strategy where you move some of the fuel from the center of the reactor to the outside and place new fuel near the center of the reactor where it has been uh, burned uh, more and produced much more uh, power. So this is the case of the cylindrical uh, geometry and uh, we can have now a table where we have a summary of the uh, flux distributions, uh, the ones that we derived in our course and let's see also what they have in uh, the general textbooks and compare the results. Uh, we use this uh, in one dimensional the sphere, uh, spherical reactor, we said that the buckling, the geometric buckling is pi over r squared. And we said that the solution of the flux takes the shape of sine pi r divided into pi r. Wonderful. Uh, we took the case of the finitite cylinder. We said that the buckling, the geometric buckling is two components, a buckling and the top uh, leak uh, representing the leakage from the top and the bottom of the reactor, uh, plus uh, a leakage from the surface of the cylinder. And we said that the solution of the flux uh, is a product of a cosine. Is a product of a cosine and the Bessel function of the first kind of the zeros order in the radial uh, dimension. Okay, well, that's uh, really uh, very nice. Now let's see what uh, uh, you'll find in the textbooks. In the textbooks, they consider a semi-infinite cylinder, a cylinder that has a radius r, but goes in the z dimension to infinity and minus infinity, which is totally unrealistic. So in that case, the term for the cosine distribution here does not appear and they end up only with the J naught distribution in the r uh, dimension. Now, uh, uh, just uh, by mathematical induction, or we can go and solve the differential equation for the Cartesian geometry, uh, you'll find that in the same way that you have a leakage on the top and bottom and then the radial direction of the cylinder, you find that you have leakage on the top and the bottom of the parapipide uh, in the x dimension, leakage in the top and the bottom of the, the parapipide uh, in the y dimension, leakage on the sides uh, pi over c squared in the z uh, dimension. And in that case, you find that the solution uh, in the uh, uh, x dimension, y dimension, and z dimension resembles our solution for the cylinder for the cosine. And you can uh, go and solve the problem in more detail, but uh, this is really the important part here, the cylindrical geometry. So you have a product of a cosine distribution in the x dimension, a cosine in the y dimension, cosine in the z uh, dimension, and the buckling is the sum of the three. And uh, in our solution here, uh, you find that if you have a cube, in a cube, the A and the B and the C of the parapipide, A equal B equals B equals C. So in that case, you have three pi over A squared, that would be the side lengths of the cube. And uh, in the solution for the flux and the power, the A, the B and the C here are all equal to A, but you have a product of three cosine functions in the X, Y and Z dimension. Uh, when the, they treat it uh, in some textbooks, uh, they take a semi-infinite semi slab, meaning that you have uh, in uh, Cartesian geometry, instead of the Cartesian geometry that we treat here, uh, they take it as uh, uh, simply a, uh, a slab that goes to infinity uh, and uh, minus infinity in the y direction as well as in the z direction, and they only solve in the x dimension. So in that case, uh, they come up with a solution that's a cosine pi x over a, which is totally unrealistic. It, it gives an idea though about the shape of the flux. Uh, in our case for the cylinder, we uh, derive the cosine in the X and Y Z direction. Some of you would be encouraged of course, to take uh, those who will continue taking courses, uh, a course in partial differential equations because you could see it arises in 
uh, many engineering fields, whenever you deal with spherical geometry, definitely you deal with partial differential uh, equations. And some of you would be there, contact, uh, they remember this part of our class as being uh, an introduction to uh, partial differential uh, equations. All right, uh, why did we go through that whole trouble? We go through that whole trouble because we said at the beginning of the class, that means that uh, we are able in that case to treat an actual nuclear reactor geometry. So we are going to take now the criticality, uh, not of the sphere, remember just as a, a quick summary here, in the case of the sphere, we got a function for the solution of the flux and hence the power of sine r over r, uh, in the case of the uh, finite cylinder, uh, it was a solution of uh, uh, J naught, uh, at least uh, in, as a function of the uh, radius R, and a cosine uh, in the case of the uh, periphery pi. Uh, if you plot the sine R over R and the cosine and the J naught on the same X, you'll find that they're very close to each other, but different, but different. That's why we go through the trouble of finding the solution. Now, if we use a pressurized water reactor, we know that, uh, in fact, both pressurized water reactors and boiling water reactors are in the case of a sphere. So let us take a homogeneous cylindrical core of an actual pressurized water reactor. You'll find that uh, there are some uh, uh, substitutes uh, added to the reactor. The coolant uh, would be having some uh, natural boron or uh, 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 boric acid dissolved in, dissolved in the coolant and uh, at a very low concentration, 2.21 uh, parts per billion. And uh, the boron absorbs neutrons. So at the beginning of the age of the reactor when you are running it with new fuel, uh, that boron absorbs neutrons as is burned. And uh, in that case, uh, boron is, is a, a poison. It's like the control rods. Uh, we call it a burnable poison. Uh, what happens in that case is that you can start the reactor with that burnable poison at a high enrichment of the fuel, let's say 5%, uh, because you are burning some of the neutrons, losing some of the neutrons. And in that case, the period between refueling of the reactor would be extended. So instead of refueling the reactor after a year, you find yourself refueling it after maybe a year and a half uh, or so. So let us say that uh, that burnable poison now absorbs the neutrons, uh, and we so it, the boron has to be taken into account, and uh, the fuel is uranium dioxide at a typical 2.78 percent enrichment in uranium 235. Knowing that the sphere is the uh, or the cube is ge are geometries where the leakage from the surface is less than the cylindrical core, uh, in the mechanical design we. Uh, basically, based on thermal considerations, we take the height as 3.7 meters, and uh, we take the height to diameter ratio as equal uh, to one. That makes it as close as possible to a sphere, even though it's a cylinder uh, and close to uh, a cube. And I can give you a problem to calculate the critical masses of a cube, a sphere, uh, and the cylinder that has a height to diameter ratio of one, meaning that the height is equal to the diameter. And you'll discover that the sphere would uh, produce a minimum uh, critical mass of the three geometry. So this is a PWR and now we have water as a coolant. So we can go and calculate the uh, number densities. And from the number densities, we can calculate the macroscopic absorption cross section and the macroscopic transport meat free pass. We're not going to go through the details, assuming that we know how to do it from the previous chapter. Uh, the water, of course, contains hydrogen and it contains uh, uh, half uh, the amount of uh, uh, oxygen than the hydrogen. So you take that number, divide into two, you take that number, you divide into two. These are the number densities for the oxygen in the water. The cladding is made out of zirconium. It has a transport cross-section and macroscopic cross-section. Notice that the macroscopic cross-section has units of centimeter minus one or inverse centimeter. You have uh, also iron in the spacers uh, between the fuel elements, steel, uh, and uh, this is the uh, macroscopic transport cross-section and the absorption macroscopic cross-section. 
The boron 10, as we called it as a burnable poison, is very small in amount. Look here, that's 10 to minus six. Uh, and the absorption cross-section is high though. You see the amount is low, the transport cross-section, uh, which uh, pertains to scattering, but the absorption is rather uh, significant. And we cannot ignore the fuel. Uh, that uh, 2.38 enriched fuel contains uranium-235 uh, in, uh, 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 in a <coughs> having a transport cross-section 3 10 to minus 4. And of course, the uranium-235 is still mixed with uranium-238. That is a macroscopic cross-section in that case. Notice now that since we have uranium, uh, uh, the material now is multiplying. So it's a multiplying system. Uh, the fission can occur in the uranium-238. Uh, and the new sigma F, nu is the average number of neutrons produced per fission multiplied into macroscopic fission cross-section, capital sigma F is 1.45, 10 to minus one. Some fissions also may occur in the uranium, but you could see here it's one tenth the um, uh, uranium 238, that's one tenth the amount that happens in uranium 235. Well, okay, so this is a detail, but uh, uh, the reactor obviously contains separate moderator, the water, separate the, uh, spacers and uh, control rods and cladding, <laughs> fuel and boron as a burnable poison uh, in uh, the cooler. Uh, this is a, a realistic reactor. So we asked ourselves the question, how to calculate the criticality of that reactor? What would be uh, the critical sizes and what would be the critical uh, volume and what would be the critical mass? It's the same way that we did it for the sphere geometry in the previous chapter. Well, uh, first of all, the transport cross-section uh, adds up. So you have a total uh, transport cross-section. If you add all these numbers, it comes out to be 0 0.03618 centimeter minus one. It adds up linearly. Uh, the absorption cross-section also adds up linearly. So it becomes out to be 0 0.152 if you add all those numbers in that column. And the new sigma F uh, becomes uh, also adds up uh, linearly, so that's 0.157 neutron centimeter minus one. Well, from these uh, three values of the macroscopic cross-section is the same way that we did for the criticality of the sphere last uh, lecture. Uh, the diffusion coefficient is taken as the transport mean free pass, one third the transport mean free pass. And the transport mean free pass is one over the macroscopic uh, mean free pass cross-section, which we calculated here as a sum of that column. So you'll find that the diffusion coefficient is one divided into three times the macroscopic total cross-section. And it comes out to be 9.2 centimeter. Now, this is a, a much larger number than what we got for the sphere. Why is that? Uh, in the sphere, we were using a fast reactor. There was no moderator. So you'll find that the diffusion coefficient or the distance traveled uh, by the neutrons between interactions is much lower. <coughs> Here, in the case of a light water moderated reactor, the diffusion coefficient is 9.2 centimeters. So if you take one over nine, say it's about one over 10, so that's uh, 0.1 centimeter. So this is the transport mean free pass, the distance that a neutron uh, travels between interactions. Oh, then uh, we want to calculate also uh, the uh, criticality. So we think about the infinite medium multiplication factor. Uh, the infinite medium multiplication factor is a product of the regeneration factor, the fast fission factor, the resonance escape probability, and the fuel utilization factor. Oh, we call this a four factor formula. And we started looking at it in the natural reactors that occurred at the Oklo phenomenon. Uh, the eta here, as we said earlier in the previous uh, chapter, is new sigma f. Uh, the new is the average number of neutrons produced by fission. Uh, sigma sub f is a macroscopic fission cross-section divided by the total absorption in the fuel. That would be the absorption in the fuel plus uh, uh, only in the fuel. Uh, the epsilon would be, let's take it as one. It's usually 1.03, 1.05, 1.06. Let's take it as one. And let's assume that the resonance escape probability also is one. 
And then we are left with the F, the fuel utilization factor. Uh, this is equal to the absorptions in the fuel divided by the total absorption. Notice here there is a difference between sigma sub A, the total absorptions in the reactor. See that when you calculated that sigma sub A, we took the absorption in the hydrogen, oxygen, zirconium, iron, uranium-235, uranium-238, and boron-10. Whereas uh, in the expression for the, fuel, uh, the regeneration factor, it's only the absorption in the fuel. Uh, interestingly enough, sigma sub A, F in the uh, fuel cancels with this one, and we are left for the infinite multiplication factor as mu sigma sub F divided into the total absorption cross-section, not the absorption in the fuel only. Many people would make that mistake in the design and end up with erroneous results. Mu sigma F for the reactor, we get it from the sum of the last column uh, in the table, those two numbers here, that's mu sigma F, 0.157. So we substitute this in the numerator and divide by the total absorption cross-section here uh, for by adding the column of all the absorption cross-section of all the materials in the reactor, and we get uh, a value for the infinite medium multiplication factor as 1.0248. Now, this number is larger than one, okay? Larger than one. So in that case, uh, uh, we can make it equal to one by allowing for absorptions of fast neutrons and thermal neutrons and by leakage from the surface of the reactor. And when we make it one, we get the K effective is equal to one. Should that number not be larger than one, obviously that reactor cannot be made critical. It cannot sustain a self-sustained chain uh, reaction. Okay, so we have the D, the diffusion coefficient calculated for the reactor. This is a design calculation, obviously. And K infinity is the uh, infinite media multiplication factor. From D and the sigma sub A, we know that this is the diffusion area. Uh, as we defined it uh, uh, in the previous chapters, D over sigma A. So D, the diffusion coefficient is 9.213, here it is. And the abs microscopic absorption cross-section, the sum of the column of the absorption cross-sections here in the table right here uh, is uh, the uh, uh, 0.153. So in that case, we can calculate the uh, L square or the diffusion area as 60 uh, centimeters square. You take the square root of this, you get the diffusion length and we find that it's 7.7 centimeters. So in that case, the average distance, physical meaning for it, the average distance traveled by a neutron between the time it is born to the time it is absorbed or leaked from the system is 7.7 .7 centimeter. You can compare this to the case of the fast reactor, the uranium-235 sphere in the previous chapter, and you could see that it is 10 times as much. So the dimension of the reactor obviously is going to be much bigger than the sphere that had only about eight centimeters uh, in uh, diameter. It gives us an idea. It is not meters and it is not millimeters. So be careful as an engineer here uh, that you get uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, meaningful or uh, logical results. If you get here uh, that uh, diffusion length is one meter, then uh oh, you have go and recalculate your numbers and check your uh, dimension. So how, what did we do here? We uh, calculated the diffusion coefficient from which we got an L square and we have the K infinity. And we are ready in that case to apply the secret of the nuclear age, as we said before, is that we make the geometric buckling equal to the material buckling for criticality. So what is the material buckling? It's the same as for the sphere or a cube or any geometry. It's an infinite medium multiplication factor minus one divided into uh, the diffusion area. And the uh, K infinity as was calculated, 10248 minus one, divided into the diffusion area 60 centimeters squared. So the material buckling is 4.124 10 to minus four centimeter. Uh, you'll find that uh, in the case of the, uh, uh, the sphere, the uranium-235 sphere, the Godiva experiment, in fact, <coughs> the extrapolation length was very small, about two centimeters, we ignored it. But for a nuclear reactor, 
uh, of the size of uh, 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 that we are dealing with, you'll find that it's about 20 centimeters. So we cannot ignore it. And so the extrapolation length is 0.71, the transport mean free pass, or one over the transport mean free pass is the inverse of the transport macroscopic cross section. And you find that the neutrons leak out of the surface of the reactor a distance of 19.62 centimeters. So we can ignore it for a large reactor if it's two meters, but uh, uh, for a detailed calculation, if the reactor doesn't have a reflector, doesn't have a region that reflects the neutrons back, that's called the bare reactor, it has to be taken into account. Notice uh, the secret of the nuclear age, as we try to call it, is that for criticality, for self-sustained chain reaction, my material buckling here, uh, the, uh, the K infinity and L squared depend on the enrichment, the composition of the cladding, uh, the zirconium, the iron, uh, the uranium in the fuels. These are all material properties. And we equate those to the geometric uh, uh, buckling. So we equate the material buckling to the geometric uh, buckling. And uh, notice that uh, the uh, geometric uh, buckling in the cylinder, we said, is equal to the uh, buckling in the uh, z direction, which is pi over the h extrapolated now squared, uh, plus the buckling in the z dimension. We also suggested that the height of the reactor, uh, uh, based on uh, thermal hydraulics calculation, was taken as three, 370 uh, centimeters. So we add to that height uh, twice the uh, extrapolation lengths on the top and the bottom of the reactor. So that's two multiplied into 19.62 centimeter. And uh, uh, this uh, means that here uh, uh, we know already the uh, buckling in the uh, Z dimension. Uh, we substitute for it. We can get the buckling in the, Z, uh, this is the buckling. Uh, uh, we get the buckling in the Z uh, dimension. All right, wonderful. So what is the buckling in the uh, Z dimension? Uh, we know what it is. It's 5.9 10 to minus 5 centimeters because we know the height of the reactor and we know the extrapolation lengths. Now, the last step is that uh, that B, Z, B sub Z square, the buckling in the Z dimension we set for today for the cylindrical geometry uh, should be equal to 2.405 divided into the extrapolation uh, radius. We replace the R here by the extrapolation radius. <coughs> and that should be equated to the buckling uh, to uh, uh, here. Uh, the, uh, we calculated that, that B sub square in the radial dimension should be equal to 3.534 times or minus four centimeters uh, uh, to the fourth power. And uh, if uh, in that case, we can solve for the extrapolated radius of the reactor. Uh, the extrapolated radius by the scissor rule is 2.405 divided into the square root of that 3.534 times the minus four. This is, uh, uh, we can multiply numerator and denominator by 100 that would cancel that 10 to minus four. And you find that the square root of 3.5 is 1.88. And you find that the geometric the radius, extrapolated radius is 127 centimeter. Subtract from this the extrapolation lengths uh, 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 from uh, the radius, because we are looking radially, we don't uh, take twice as much. And the radius of the reactor for criticality, where the geometric buckling again, uh, the criticality condition, uh, the geometric buckling being equal to the material buckling is 108 centimeters. So the diameter of the reactor would be about two meters. It is not the eight centimeters for the fast reactor uh, that we considered for the sphere in the last chapter. Uh, it is now a, a large reactor uh, that is moderated, that has water and the coolant and the control rods and uh, spacers and uh, uh, burnable poison. Uh, this is a more realistic system. Uh, we have chosen the height here to make uh, uh, the thermal hydraulics suitable. So remember that is uh, given uh, in the design process. So we took the height as 3.7 meters or 370 centimeters. And we get that 
to get the system to be critical, uh, I have to build the reactor with a radius, and that's uh, uh, now a consideration uh, that is uh, 108 centimeter in radius or 216 centimeters in diameter. Oh, from the radius here, we can calculate the critical volume. And uh, we calculated the critical volume and then multiplied it by the density for the sphere to calculate the critical mass. So, but for the cylinder, remember, uh, the volume of the cylinder is the area of the base pi r sub uh, r squared, the core radius multiplied into the height. And we calculated the core radius is 1.08, uh, 108 centimeter. So pi multiplied by 108 squared multiplied by the height 370 gives me that uh, we get uh, 13, uh, 10 to the six centimeter cubed. As engineers, we don't, we like to choose the correct the suitable or the units that match our calculation. We don't give the answer as 13 million centimeter cube. We know that the million centimeter cube is one meter cube. So in that case, we say that the critical volume of the reactor would be 13.6 cubic uh, meter. And uh, if you know the density, the average density of the materials in the core, you multiply the average density by the uh, critical volume and you get the critical mass of the reactor. Obviously it would be in the metric tons rather than being in the kilograms, like in the case of a fast reactor, uh, the uh, Godiva experiment, uh, pure uranium-235. Uh, since we calculated the buckling and uh, we want to give it a physical meaning, we can calculate the leakage from the system in the criticality equation, if you remember in the previous chapter, uh, that basically the probability of uh, leakage uh, of the neutrons or the fraction of neutron le leaking from the critical core would be one minus the thermal non-leakage probability. And uh, in our derivations earlier, it was one divided by one plus L square uh, B square. So you take one minus uh, the uh, diffusion area we calculated at 60 centimeters square, uh, the total buckling in that case, that's a total uh, in the radial dimension and the axial dimension uh, on the Z dimension of four ten to minus four, you'll find that in that case, we are having a leakage of 2.4% of, of the neutrons leaking from the surface of the uh, reactor. Uh, so this is uh, basically uh, an actual calculation. So I'll ask you maybe to repeat it uh, for uh, uh, a repeat it maybe for a cubical reactor, but uh, of interest, of course, uh, uh, it would be nice to compare a spherical core with similar radiation, uh, radii. Uh, go to the table where we uh, listed the buckling expressions uh, and uh, compare a spherical core to a core in the shape of a cube to a core in the shape of a cylinder and uh, prove to yourself that uh, a spherical core uh, would be uh, basically uh, have the least critical mass uh, in any kind of practical configuration uh, in general. So uh, if uh, you want really to do a design calculation for a nuclear reactor, maybe I can give you the one for an actual finite cylinder with uh, fuel and you can go and calculate those numbers that I gave you in the table. The fuel would be spaced with a different uh, kind of spacing. They call it a pitch. 15 centimeter, or oh, that's actually uh, a can-do type of a reactor where we are using natural uranium with a heavy water moderator, and that would be a calculation for a can-do uh, reactor. Okay, uh, uh oh, I, I messed up the whole thing here. Uh, uh, so I'll uh, stop sharing uh, and uh, see if you have any questions. This is uh, definitely an important uh, chapter. Uh, because in that case, uh, let me see here. No, I don't want to share. I have to share first and then stop sharing. Uh, share and then stop the share and go to the chat room now. Uh, see if you have any questions about it. <clears throat> Uh, this was a very important lecture, obviously, because now uh, for all the theory that we developed and uh, 
nice uh, coverage, uh, we reach a stage where we know how to design uh, a nuclear reactor to get it to operate. Uh, and uh, we also extended our knowledge from just dealing with an idealized geometry of a sphere uh, or a semi-infinite cylinder or a semi-infinite slab into an actual calculation. Uh, we expanded our knowledge of, an, for an example, in partial differential equations, which each one of you will meet uh, in their careers. Uh, whenever you deal with a cylindrical geometry, oh, you cannot avoid that Bessel function uh, of any one of the orders or the kinds uh, that we cover today. All right, uh, there are no questions, so we go back uh, and share. Uh, we want to use all the time we, uh, we can uh, in our class here and uh, uh, pick up uh, some uh, interesting chapters. We have reached really the goal of our course today by learning how to design a fission reactor because these are the reactors that will help us uh, fight uh, global warming and uh, basically uh, people consider it now as a, an existential type of a problem for the human race, other than the COVID-19. Uh, you notice that uh, global warming comes now to uh, the fore. It's becoming uh, reconsidered back again. Uh, scientists tell us that we have 12 years to act on it. If we don't, then basically uh, our human race is in danger. Uh, uh, the, for instance, uh, you heard about the, the that uh, condominium that collapsed in Florida, some people suggest it may be caused by global warming by the level of the oceans and the tides in the area uh, being more frequent, uh, it affected the foundation. So basically we would have to move uh, uh, many of the population of the world. Imagine Venice, for instance, uh, all the population, in Venice already they don't allow uh, uh, cruise ships to get into Venice because they are uh, destroying the shores of the canals in Venice. So go and visit Venice because it, before it disappears under the waters of the Mediterranean uh, Sea, uh, if we do not do something about that uh, 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 change in the climate by burning the fossil fuels. And in that case, what we are learning about nuclear energy is the alternative really to uh, maybe save uh, our world. Yes, we. Uh, have to make our reactor safer and safer. Uh, we have to dispose of the nuclear waste, but that is, uh, in addition to renewables, that is the salvation of the our technological civilization uh, in general. Uh, if you uh, are a group of people, an elite group of engineers who will be uh, designing and perfecting and operating our future nuclear power plants, uh, then you are going to be dealing with radiation and uh, in that case, uh, uh, we cannot ignore the effect of radiation. So uh, definitely we'd like to talk more about space nuclear power, but we don't have time. So I invite you to go and read more about it if you're uh, an aerospace engineer. But what we need to do now is go and learn a little bit more on how to protect ourselves. And all of you will be leaders in your field. You will be responsible for people working under you uh, you have to protect uh, yourself, that's a selfish part of it, but you have to protect also uh, other people that would be working with you. So we'll go to the uh, part on the radiological science and pick up some of the chapters that would uh, uh, basically uh, uh, have us understand uh, how to protect ourselves and other people if we work in a radiation field. It could, doesn't have to be a nuclear power plant. Uh, it could be a nuclear submarine, uh, and it could be maybe even a hospital where nuclear medicine is uh, used to cure uh, diseases uh, of people in general. <coughs> now remember about uh, radiation. Uh, when you talk about radiation of interest to us, is not any form of radiation. Like uh, we know that we have the electromagnetic spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum covers a very, very large range in terms of the energy contents of the photons, uh, as well as the wavelengths. So uh, the right column here shows us, uh, the, the left scale shows us the wavelengths. And notice that the wavelengths here in centimeter could be 
very large, one billion centimeter. This is electrical power as we use it in our computers, in our home or lighting our streets. But the electromagnetic radiation also can be very, very, very short. Look at this here. That's 10, one uh, trillions of a centimeter. And the one trillions of centimeter in uh, the wavelengths corresponds to a very high energy. Why? Because the equation that describes the energy content of a photon uh, is uh, uh, h nu. Nu is the frequency. So if you have a short wavelength, like here, 10 to minus 12 centimeter, uh, you find that you have a huge amount of energy. And the uh, right hand side shows us the energy of the photons in electron volts. When you have a very short wavelength, because E is equal to H, the blank constant multiplied into nu, the frequency of the radiation, and the frequency of the radiation is the speed of light, 3, 10 to the 10 centimeter per second divided into <coughs> the wavelengths, you find that very short wavelengths corresponds to cosmic radiation, we call it. And the notice here that uh, the energy that it can carry is 10 uh, million electron volts. So that's 10, 10 to the 6, 10 million electron volts. In fact, cosmic radiation can be even in the giga electron volts. Uh, in that uh, region, we also have the X-rays and the gamma, what we call gamma rays. X-rays usually are a result of atomic interactions of the electrons in the outer shell of the atoms. Uh, and gamma rays are really based on interactions with the nuclei themselves, like radioactivity. Uh, so they overlap in range and they can have energies from say the, uh, let's say here, 10, uh, 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 10 to the third power, which is one kilo electron volt in the X-rays uh, up to something in the range of the tens or hundreds of million electron volts in the gamma rays. And this is a range of interest uh, that is of interest to us, the gamma radiation and X-rays that have high energy. Why is that? Because once you reach the level of the kilo electron volt or the million electron volts, radiation can affect living matter. It has a biological effect on living matter in that it can strip uh, the uh, uh, electrons from around the atoms. And now the atom lost an electron. Atoms usually are neutral. They lose an electron. They become ions. Uh, ions would be a positive charge in the atom. So in that case, high energy radiation, the X-rays and gamma rays are considered to be uh, ionizing radiation. And that's what we worry about because the, uh, uh, the radiation can uh, affect the uh, genes on the strands of the chromosomes inside the nuclei of living matter. They can cause one or two effects. Either they kill the atom, the, the, the atom and the, the body either renews it, or it can also lead to mutations. If you have mutations, uh, the cell starts dividing in an abnormal way and we get uh, cancers that eventually over a long period of time uh, become a nuisance for the, uh, the, for the individual that is affected by that radiation and it can kill the person. Uh, just for completeness, uh, 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 the visible light that we see in our eyes, the very, very small range here uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum. We don't see the ultraviolet light, but even though in the summer, if you expose your skin to the ultraviolet light, uh, the color will change. You'll get melanin uh, formed under the skin, but you can also burn your skin. Some animals like bees and uh, uh, dogs can see uh, the some of the ultraviolet light, which is high energy, uh, higher in energy than the visible light. And the infrared is simply what we call heat. Like we can, we have sensors in our skin that can sense uh, the heat in general. Uh, our technological society also deals with electromagnetic radiation uh, in radio, television, and radar in what we call microwaves because uh, 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 those uh, have basically very short, uh, 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 have low energy in that case, but they have uh, a relatively long wavelengths. Uh, electric power that we use in our electrical outlet in lighting uh, has a range in the a billion uh, centimeter in wavelengths. Uh, and the radio, television, and radar is from 0.1 centimeter here all the way to uh, 
uh, uh, one million centimeter or one kilometer uh, in length. Induction heating, when we heat, uh, uh, we use electric field and induction, uh, uh, magnetic field and in induction also are in the range of 10 to the minus 10 uh, electron volt. So notice how the electromagnetic spectrum covers such a very, very large range uh, uh, from the millimeter waves or uh, uh, <coughs> here, uh, this is a millimeter, uh, uh, 10 to the minus three centimeter would be right here all the way to the top uh, 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 of, is of interest uh, in all our applications. But uh, our senses are very, very limited. So we use instrumentation uh, in measuring different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. We have seen this in the detection of gamma the gamma radiation uh, chapter in general. Okay, we said then that our interest in our class here would be uh, in uh, the uh, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum where we have enough energy in the photons to cause ionization. And if we, well, that's why we're interested in uh, ionizing radiation, not uh, any, well, not any form of radiation, even though it's important and it can save your life. I'll try to cover that in another chapter. But uh, we have directly two types of uh, ionizing radiation. Some uh, are cause ionization indirectly and some cause ionization directly. So let's take an example of an atom here where you have a high energy neutron. Uh, it can pass close to the nucleus. It doesn't see uh, the electrons. It is neutral. It can pass through it and cause no ionization. Even in the hydrogen atom with one electron, a neutron can come close to the nucleus and cause no ionization. Only if that high energy neutron hits the nucleus, only if it hits the nucleus, uh, and uh, in that case, you get uh, intense ionization because the nucleus now is uh, stripped of its electron and uh, the, en the neutron itself loses some of its energy and uh, it can also come in uh, in a hydrogen atom and uh, uh, interact with the nucleus. It can uh, 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 interact with the nucleus, emit a very energetic uh, 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 photon and in that case, you find that you can have either uh, direct ionization or indirect ionization. Uh, basically, ionization usually by neutron is designated as indirectly ionizing radiation. Uh, if you have gamma radiation, though, it, uh, it can, like in the Compton scattering process or the pair production or the, uh, 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 you find that you have uh, uh, a direct kind of uh, uh, ionization in that the gamma photon would eject an electron. So direct ionizing radiation tends to deposit its energy at a localized range in materials, uh, whereas indirectly ionizing radiation deposits it along its whole path. And that would be shown in figure uh, three here. Let us go there and then come back. So let's look here at how radiation would deposit its energy depending on the type of radiation and the material that, is, uh, that we encounter. Uh, for instance, uh, neutrons and X-rays are indirectly ionizing. You'll find that if you have uh, a, a material, uh, they'll deposit their energy in an exponentially decreasing uh, way. Whereas uh, uh, some other types of radiation, neon or protons, uh, deposit their energy uh, near the end of their pass. As they lose their energy, they lose their energy uh, gradually, but then at the end of their pass, they deposit all that energy at one spot. That's called the Bragg's curve. And this basically represents a tumor uh, in tissue, uh, in nuclear medicine. You find that if you use neutrons or X-rays, you are irradiating the tissue uh, ahead of the tumor, whereas protons or neon ions would can deposit their energy right at the side of the tumor without irradiating the rest of the body. And that is why it is a desirable feature uh, to use uh, uh, proton beams maybe in the treatment of soft tissue cancer or brain cancers in, in general. Now we go back and uh, remind ourselves with the units that we use in radiation measurements in general. Uh, when we dealt with a chapter on radioactivity, we defined the activity. So today we go back and look at all the different uh, units that we use uh, in measuring uh, 
uh, the effects of ionizing radiation. We define the activity as uh, dn by dt, and we use the Becquerel with an abbreviation BQ. We need to know really the name. Uh, that's Henri Becquerel, the French scientist that uh, discovered radioactivity. And one Becquerel is one disintegration per second or one transformation per second or one decay per second, depending on the source that you are reading. Earlier on, before the SI system of units was uh, implemented, uh, we used the Curie. And the Curie is the uh, activity or the number of disintegrations per second in one gram of the isotope 226 of radium. So you find that uh, one Becquerel uh, contains 27 times the minus 12 uh, Curie, or you can say that one Curie is 3.7 times to the 10th uh, Becquerel or disintegrations per uh, second. Now, interestingly enough, uh, uh, even though the SI system is recommended, uh, people continue using the Curie unit. So we are bound here to learn about the two of them because they are used interchangeably. Uh, so in that case, you find that uh, we have to remember the Curie as one disintegration per second, uh, the Becquerel, yeah, then the Curie is a 3.7 10 to the 10th disintegrations per second. And that's the unit that we use uh, in terms of uh, the activity of a given radioactive source or fine. However, uh, there are other units that uh, uh, we can use uh, if we are dealing with radiation in the air. Uh, we said that for some radiations that have enough energy can ionize the air. Ionize the air is that they strip the outer electrons from the nitrogen or the oxygen uh, in the air. And in that case, you get uh, ionizing radiation. So in that case, in air only, remember this, this is only in air, uh, gamma radiation can cause ionization. And we'll try to use another unit in that case that we are going to call the exposure. The exposure is how much uh, charge we are creating in air as a result of the presence of radioactive uh, materials. Now, uh, along the way, we cannot ignore uh, and understand how radiation occurs uh, around us. and. Uh, uh, first, we should not fear radiation because it's part of nature. I did mention earlier that as an e electrolyte in our body that runs our muscles and our, uh, all our uh, 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 neural system is the presence of electrolytes like potassium. And uh, now potassium occurs in nature as an isotope potassium-40, and that potassium-40 uh, is a beta emitter and has a half-life in, <coughs> in the billions of years. So you cannot get rid of it and you need potassium in your body. Like uh, my, uh, my breakfast today was a banana and banana is notorious for containing enough potassium. So the body needs that potassium, but 0.01% of that potassium is in the form of potassium 40 and it is radioactive. So our food supply contains radioactive material. Uh, if you think about another radioactive material in our body is uh, carbon. Carbon-14 is formed by the interaction of neutrons from cosmic rays uh, with uh, the nitrogen in the, uh, and oxygen in the atmosphere. And then those neutrons basically produce an isotope of carbon, carbon-14. As long as a plant or an animal, including humans, is alive, uh, it eats food. What is the food? Like carbohydrate, carbon and hydrogen. Sugar is a carbohydrate, remember? Uh, it's not a hydrocarbon though. Hydrocarbons are designate more like, uh, 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 like coal and uh, oil and uh, natural gas. Hydrocarbon. CH4 is natural gas. It has a carbon, C, and H4, four hydrogen atoms. So we differentiate between hydrocarbons and carbohydrates. Carbohydrates contains that radioactive carbon. So as long as we live, uh, we are incorporating in our body uh, different radioactive isotopes, uh, uh, particularly carbon-14 and the uh, uh, potassium-40. In fact, if you take an adult human, uh, we weigh about 70 kilogram each. Uh, our body contains, in terms of activity, uh, 100 becquerel per gram. So in our body, uh, we have seven-third 
7,000 becquerel of activity, each one of us. So this means uh, uh, we get 7,000 disintegrations of nuclei in our body per second. I repeat again, becquerel is disintegrations per second. So if you take 100 kilo, becquerel per gram, multiply into uh, 70 kilogram average weight of a person, so that at 7,000 disintegrations per second. So part of our body is radioactive. We are radioactive uh, and we are part of nature. Uh, whenever you have solids in the food we eat and so on, you find that it contains more radioactivity. So one kilogram of coffee contains uh, 1,000 becquerel of activity. Uh, Superphosphate fertilizer, uh, phosphate rocks uh, uh, come in from uh, uh, mining phosphate uh, deposits. Phosphate deposits are really uh, organisms that happened at the bottom of the sea, the bones particularly of fish, and uh, deposits of uranium and thorium also uh, deposited themselves into the fertilizer. So when we fertilize our crops or we fertilize the, the, uh, the, what you grow in our, our gardens, you'll find that the fertilizer itself contains 5,000 Becquerel per kilogram uh, of the material, much more than we have in our body, obviously. Uh, even the air that we breathe, uh, remember that uranium and thorium are very common. Uh, if, say, you have built your home on top of a, a granite deposit, you'll find that the uranium uh, decays, and as it decays, uh, the radon gas is formed. We looked at it in the chain decay of uranium. And uh, at room temperature, the boiling point is very low, so uh, radon gas comes out as a gas. It's an inert gas, so it doesn't hurt us in terms of chemistry, but it decays itself into polonium-10 and lead-210, and these are solids. And particularly for people who smoke cigarettes, uh, they end up with both the chemical toxicity from the benzoapyrene in the smoke, but and the smoke is particulate matter, so they deposit in their lungs some of that radon gas that is now polonium-210 and lead-210, they emit alpha particles and they end up with lung cancer. So when you have a home that is built on a deposit of uranium or thorium, you find that the radon gas emanates. And the Surgeon General, in fact, warns us about radon in homes as being a very major health issue. So because when you graduate and you start buying a home, the first thing you do is you go to a hardware store, buy a, uh, a kit that would measure the radon gas before you sign a contract to buy a home or find some contractors to reduce the amount of uh, radon gas in your home. So a um, 100 typical 100 meter square home would contain a radon gas uh, uh, that emits an activity of 3,000 to, uh, uh, to 30,000 disintegrations pair uh, in the home itself. Smoke detectors uh, have uh, saved hundreds of thousands of lives and they use a radioactive isotope, americium-241. And these emit 30,000 disintegrations per second alpha particles. Uh, that's why when you have a smoke detector in your home, you don't go and place it in the kitchen. You don't place it on uh, hallways where people are, there is traffic. You don't place it on top of your bed, obviously. Uh, you place it in an area, maybe in an attic, where uh, it can sense uh, the presence of smoke and save your lives. Hundreds of thousands of people have been saved uh, by that source of radiation. And that's why also when you dispose of smoke detectors, you dispose of them not in landfills, but in special places. Now, of course, radioisotopes are used in both medical diagnosis, diagnosing disease, in that case, you find that we use very mega doses of radiation, really 70 million uh, becquerel. And uh, we also use it in therapy, curing disease, not just uh, imaging and diagnosing disease, but in that case, we go to doses in the 10 to the 14th becquerel. Uh, uh, nuclear waste is going to be part of our future because when we fission the uranium, we end up with fission products that need to be disposed of you find that that would contain 10 to the 13th becquerel. And uh, an interesting thing here, if you get uranium and uh, manufacture pure uranium, you separate it from its uh, fission, uh, its decay products or its daughter product from the radon, for instance, or the radium, 
you'll find that it doesn't contain much uh, uranium, uh, uh, but it is radioactive, 25 million uh, becquerel. Uh, but uh, if you go to the ore, uh, that is a Canadian ore, 15% natural uranium, it's also uh, 25 million becquerel. Uh, Australian ores have uh, less of uh, basically na natural uranium in them, 0.3% of that of 15%, but they contain radioactivity. And uh, low-level waste, that would be the uh, uh, gowns that are used uh, and uh, maybe uh, uh, towels in, uh, uh, in wastewater when leakage happens, maybe from piping in nuclear power plants, that's designated as low-level waste. Uh, you have 1 million becquerel uh, or uh, 1 million disintegrations per second. The interesting thing is that uh, you don't have to be working nuclear energy to meet with uh, radiation. Uh, the ash of coal, after you burn the coal, uh, you are left with the ash and the coal itself contains uranium. So whatever hasn't been already dispersed in the atmosphere as smoke from coal burning is still in the ash. And look at this, that's 2000 Becquerel uh, in one kilogram. And uh, granite is notorious for, con that's why you don't build a house on top of granite, especially in the Appalachian or the Rocky Mountains. And that's why you check for radon gas present in the, the home that you'll buy after you graduate and you get your wonderful job and uh, get a good uh, uh, living salary. Uh, one kilogram of granite contains a thousand uh, Becquerel. Uh, an interesting thing, when, if you travel to New York, uh, they have central station there, train station, and that central station, uh, they use lots of granite, and uh, definitely granite contains uranium and thorium, so the granite itself, some people use it also on countertops, and that contains a thousand becquerel of uh, radiation in general. Okay, so in that case, uh, radiation is all the way around us. It's in our body, in the food we eat, in the places we live. Uh, if you live in a brick house, you'll find that you have more radiation because of the presence of the uranium and the thorium in the materials used to make the brick. If you live in a wooden house, you still get radiation from the carbon-14 in the, in, the, in the wood. Wood is, uh, contains carbon. So uh, if you uh, deal with radiation in the air, like from radon gas, for instance, uh, you get ionization, and we define a new unit here, other than the activity, we call it the exposure. Uh, the unit of the exposure measures how much charge, the charge, uh, uh, static charge, uh, obviously, uh, is measured in Coulomb. In, and uh, if we take the charge that is created by ionization in the air, uh, per kilogram of air, we call this the exposure. Uh, to honor uh, one gentleman, uh, the gentleman who invent, who discovered X-rays, Mr. Rontigan, uh, we use a unit of the Rontigan that is 2.58 tens of minus 4 coulomb of charge per kilogram of air. We have to specify here that is air. It's not a material, all right? Again, exposure is purely ionization in uh, the air. Uh, and uh, if uh, you want a unit that uh, you don't want to remember that constant here, uh, one electrostatic unit of charge is 3.33 10 to minus 10 coulomb. So you can uh, basically uh, redefine the, the uh, Rontgen as being uh, the amount of charge uh, of one electrostatic unit of charge uh, through the interaction. Uh, we are interested in X-rays or gamma rays in 0.0012 grams of air at standard temperature and pressure, STP. Standard uh, pressure is uh, one atmosphere and standard temperature is 20 degrees Celsius or uh, 273 plus 20, that's 293 Kelvins. Uh, that uh, Rontgen unit is very large, so we use a milli Rontgen 10 to the minus three uh, Rontgen. So you can say that the Rontgen is a unit in the SI system of unit and the coulomb per kilogram is a unit in the, uh, uh, sorry, the Rontgen is in the conventional system of units and the uh, coulomb per kilogram is the uh, amount of uh, exposure in the, <coughs> uh, uh, in the uh, SI system of units. Uh, ionization uh, in the same way that I showed you uh, that radiation is in our body, it's all around us. It's ubiquitous all over uh, 
our world uh, and our living conditions, uh, our air also contains lots of radiation. So if you have a source of radon in the air, uh, and uh, let's say that you go and measure uh, uh, ionization, let's take a very low level of ionization, some presence of gamma rays in the air. That would be one millirantigan maybe per hour, 1,000 of a rantigan per hour. Let's use dimensional analysis, start with one millirantigan per hour, turn it into rantigan uh, uh, per uh, millirantigan, so you multiply by 10 to minus three, uh, that's a millirantigan now per hour. Uh, take the hour, turn the hour into seconds. There are 60 minutes uh, multiplied into 60 seconds per hour. Then convert the definition of the uh, rantigan into charge. So he said that uh, in coulomb per kilogram of air, of air, 2.58 tens to minus four is the definition of the rantigan. <clears throat> so in that case, rantigan and rantigan cancel. You're left with coulomb per uh, kilogram. Take the charge of the electron, uh, 1.6 10 to minus 19 coulomb, coulomb, and in that case, you get the number of ions per coulomb of charge. Then turn your kilogram of air into grams, 10 to, to the 10 to the third. And then uh, we know that the uh, weight, the one centimeter cube of air weighs 0 0.001293 grams. So gram and gram cancel, kilogram and kilogram cancel. And we are left here. Uh, in ions generated per centimeter cube per second. And look at this, if you have one millirantigan per hour of exposure, uh, you generate about 600 ions in one centimeter cube per second. So you could see that a small, very small rate of exposure or ionization can lead to a huge ionization forming in a one centimeter cube, just about 600 ions. And uh, so that's a considerable amount, obviously. But again, it tells us about uh, the uh, unit of exposure and uh, uh, the presence of radiation uh, around us. When we dealt with the sterilization of food products and uh, medical products in the chapter on the applications of uh, radioactivity, uh, we defined uh, the absorbed dose. So that's a third unit other than the activity, the exposure, we deal with a unit of the absorbed dose. Notice that the unit of the absorbed dose does not apply to living material. It applies to wood, maybe, the amount of radiation that you can use on wood to polymerize it and have wood that is impregnated with plastic uh, for tabletops, for instance. Uh, you'll find that uh, the absorbed dose unit calculate the amount of imparted energy per unit mass. Now, the exposure is charged per unit volume of air. Now, this is in uh, energy deposited, imparted energy per unit mass of any material that we deal with. So the imparted energy is going to be equal to the energy in, in a given volume of material minus the radiation carrying E out, plus any possible reaction, the Q values, in fact, of reactions happening in that uh, material that uh, may be sterilizing uh, milk uh, uh, by radiation. And we define in that case the absorbed dose as the imparted energy is at delta E sub D here per unit mass. So you could see here that uh, energy deposited in the material, we call it the dose per unit mass. And in the conventional system of unit, we use what is called the radiation absorbed dose. That is the unit there, and the abbreviation of it is the RAD. Some people tell you the Rontigan absorbed dose. It's not the Rontigan. Uh, Rontigan has already been a unit given to the exposure. So that's radiation absorbed dose, and that is basically 100 ergs. This is the unit of energy in the conventional system of units per gram. And uh, one erg is uh, one joule is 10 to the seventh earth, 10 million ergs. So you'll find that one RAD is 0.1 joule per. Uh, kilogram. All right, so that uh, describes to us uh, energy deposited per unit mass. In the SI system of units, uh, uh, another unit has been used uh, uh, honoring a, a researcher in the field, Mr. Gray, abbreviated as ZY, and the gray is one joule per kilogram, or it is equal to 100 rad. And uh, in that case, we can say that uh, uh, one uh, uh, 
one unit of energy, the red uh, being uh, uh, one, uh, 100 red is one gray. So uh, one red is one centigray or one, one hundredth of a gray. So in that case, uh, you find that in the rest of the chapter, when I refer to grays, uh, I'll say, oh, uh, it's uh, say a red, which is also the same as uh, one hundredth of uh, one centi or one hundred uh, of a gray, because uh, uh, even though we are supposed to use, as I said, the SI system of units, people continue using the uh, conventional system of units. We talk about the dose rate. Uh, first, we talk about the small quantities of the gray, one milligray and one centigray. And we talk about the rate of deposition of the uh, uh, ab uh, absorbed dose in the same way that we use it for the exposure rate. So when you take gray per second, we call this the radiation absorbed uh, dose uh, in general. So let's remember that uh, one uh, red is uh, one hundredth of a gray. And uh, in that case, uh, we don't get confused between the SI system of units and the conventional system of units. When you deal with one red, that's the same as dealing with one hundredth of a gray. Now, the interesting thing comes in uh, when we deal with biological matter, when we deal with human tissue or animals, uh, dogs, cats, monkeys, whatever. Uh, in that case, we have to take into account the different effects of different types of radiation, not just different types of radiation, but the energy that they carry. So in that case, it's mostly experimental. And uh, we try to account, not uh, uh, account just for the energy deposited per unit mass, but also the effects of different types of radiation. So we define uh, uh, an empirical factor impacts called the relative biological effectiveness. Relative biological effectiveness is the RBE. This is the ratio of the effect produced by some type of radiation. And we have to take a reference, like we take the meter as a unit of lengths. Uh, we take the X-rays uh, or uh, gamma rays uh, that has, have an energy of exactly 100 kilo electron volt. And we measure the effects of different types of radiation relative to the effect of those X-rays or gamma rays. For instance, you grow bacteria in a Petri dish, you radiate them with 100 kilo electron volts or gamma rays, you, for a given time period, you measure how many of the cells have been killed, and then you take another type of radiation, you radiate a similar uh, size uh, Petri dish, and you take the ratio between them, that gives you the relative biological effectiveness. Uh, the relative biological effectiveness obviously will come uh, with a frac as a fraction, so it may have a decimal point. So we take the rounding of the radio biological effectiveness, and we call this the quant quality factor of the radiation. And we use Q value, but be careful here that it's not the Q value of a nuclear reaction like when we calculated earlier in the semester. So X-rays or gamma rays are assigned a quality factor of one, but if you use alpha particles, protons, or fast neutrons, their biological effect is much, much more pronounced than just X-rays or gamma rays. They're 10 times more effective in uh, affecting biological matter. For instance, uh, uh, destroying or killing uh, a gene on a chromosome uh, 10 times as much. So the quality factor in that case for the protons, fast neutrons is 10. Even more, if you have heavy recoil nuclei like neon nuclei, that quality factor can be 20. For uh, thermal neutrons is twice as much as X-rays. Uh, for high energy neutron, 20 million electron volts is eight. Uh, beta particles or electrons, uh, depending on their energy is maybe can be the same as X-rays or gamma rays, but it can reach 1.7. And if you use a very heavy ions like uh, uh, xenon ions, or uh, uh, then that factor can be the same as heavy recoil nuclei, a factor of 20. So what is that quality factor? It's a round off of the radiobiological effectiveness. That could be, for instance, 19.5. We round it to uh, 20 in general. So the quality factor is related directly to the degree of ionization, or what's called the linear energy transfer. How much energy a type of radiation is deposited per uh, unit length. And the unit length here is the uh, measured in micrometers, one millionth of a 
meters, micrometer, mi micrometer in uh, micron. In fact, it's abbreviated simply as micron. Look here how different types of radiation behave differently. Uh, this is a source of uh, like uh, maybe plutonium or uranium that is emitting alpha particles. You'll find that as the radiation is emitted from the alpha particles, uh, this is shown basically in uh, uh, a bubble uh, radiation, uh, uh, <clears throat> basically cloud chamber, you know, the radiation as it moves through a saturated uh, vapor like alcohol uh, creates uh, condensation tracks, the same that you see from airplanes when uh, around the dusk or by sunset when the radiation from the sun reflects through the, uh, uh, the exhaust from the engines, um, primarily of course steam uh, and water. Uh, and uh, this would be the condensation trail in a cloud chamber, cloud meaning that it has a saturated vapor as I suggest, the alcohol would be the one, and then you may have a magnetic field on it that becomes a really a magnetic cloud chamber. Oh, you know, anyway, you'll find that the alpha particles move in a straight line. You could see that. They deposit that energy linearly, and then they lose most of their energy. You can see how the track becomes thicker here, becomes thicker here, becomes thicker here. They lose all their energy locally at the end of their track. So different types of radiation uh, behave differently. Look at what electrons look like. Uh, electrons uh, emitted from a source of electrons uh, scatter uh, with the atoms, uh, change their direction. You could see a very sharp change here. Depositing their energy, that's that linear energy transfer. And again, you could see the track becoming thicker near the end. So the same as alpha particles, they lose most of their energy near the end of their uh, track. So you find that uh, that linear energy transfer is related very closely or correlates with that quality uh, factor. Now that we defined <coughs> the different effects of different types of radiation on biological matter uh, through the quality factor, we can take that quality factor now and start uh, describing a third unit. And that is the most important unit because it is now what we call the effective dose some people call it the dose equivalent, it's all the same, or the biological dose. The biological dose is defined as the uh, usual dose, which is D, uh, uh, the radiation absorbed dose, units of gray uh, or red, and multiplied by the quality factor. So in that case, we account for the effects of radiation on biological matter. Similarly, we can talk about the effective dose rate, if you take uh, the dose rate, the absorbed dose rate, but the quality factor now comes into play. And in that case, we have a new unit. <clears throat> we called it the radiation equivalent man in the conventional system of units. And uh, the acronym for it, R-E-M, is REM. So you hear or read about the REM whenever we deal with radiation. So in that case, the REM, is one red multiplied into the quality factor. Okay, so when you multiply the quality factor by the red, you get uh, the unit <clears throat> of the dose equivalent or the biological uh, dose. This is a very large amount, so we use a millirem, 10 to the minus three rem. Comes an international system of units, <clears throat> and you get a new a gentleman being honored, Mr. Sievert, uh, abbreviated as SV, and one siever, uh, uh, in the same way that the radiation absorbed dose was 100 ergs uh, per gram, uh, the sievert is equal to 100 rem. So in that case, we can also take the equivalence that one centi sievert is equal to one rem and uh, use this uh, interchangeably. So you'll find that in the table that I'll uh, show you later in the chapter, when I talk about the REM uh, or the sievert, uh, I use one centi sievert is equal to one uh, REM. Notice that natural uh, background radiation really immerses all of uh, living matter. It is not just, uh, we are not uh, immersed in a sea of radiation, if you want to call it this way or an analogy. We also are ourselves containing radiation in our body. So different parts of the world uh, basically occur in different, uh, uh, have different levels of radiation. For instance, if you go to uh, 
the uh, population of Kerala and Madras states in India, you'll find that some 100, 140,000 people receive doses which average 1.5 centisiever per year from gamma radiation uh, emission uh, uh, and as well as some um, radon uh, gas. You find that uh, 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 Brazil nuts that uh, become uh, really very cheap to buy around Christmas, they tend to concentrate thorium-232. Uh, brick and stone homes have higher natural radiation uh, than homes. The United States Capitol and Central Station in New York are largely constructed of granite or they contain higher levels of natural radiation. So radiation, uh, we are living in a field of uh, radiation. So there is natural radiation uh, around us, but uh, in our technological society, we have also created sources of man-made radiation like x-rays and they play a major role in our life like TV screens or radiation or a computer screen that you are using right now uh, is emitting some levels of radiation, particularly soft uh, x-rays in general. So when we talk about how much we are exposed in terms of radiation, we can construct that table here. And uh, in that case, we can compare the yearly per capita dose equivalent, how much you and I on average receive. Per capita in Latin per is by, capita means head, per head or per person. And uh, the units that I have used, as I suggested, is either rem per person per year or centisiever per person per year. Notice that we have two sources of radiation, the natural sources and the man-made sources. External to the body, we get uh, 0.05, or let's read it as rem. Uh, uh, this is 0 0.050 uh, rem, so that's 50 millirem of radiation from cosmic radiation. Earth minerals, 47 millirem per person per year. Building material, three millirem per person per year. So this is external to the body from nature, but internal. We are inhaling that radon gas and uh, potassium 40 and carbon 40 are in our tissue. We get another 26, uh, uh, basically milliram per person per year. So a total for each person of us, we get 126 milliram per person per year from the natural sources. We have radiation sources too, TVs and microwaves and phones and so on, but primarily radiation is used in medical procedures. On the average, diagnostic x-rays give us 50 milliram per person per year, uh, therapy 10 milliram per person per year, and sometimes internal diagnosis in therapy. So, so subtotal is 61 milliram per person per year. Notice that, that 61 milliram per person per year is one half uh, what we get from the natural radiation environment. So our uh, technology gives us one half the amount of the natural radiation. Other sources that you can think of is uh, atomic energy laboratories, TV tubes, uh, computers, that gives us two milliram per person per year. Uh, some weapons testing in the 50s released radioactivity into the atmosphere. It's still coming down and uh, we get in general 62 milliram per person per year. And the total from all the man-made sources is 67 milliram per person per year. So the total um, natural and man-made that each one of us received is 193 million uh, milliram per person per year. And uh, uh, that is uh, basically half of it, uh, or uh, one third of it from uh, uh, technolo technological uh, sources and two thirds of it from the natural radiation uh, in environment. Uh, we'll talk next time about the radiation protection principles but I would like you uh, this time to uh, simply have a fun thing to do. Uh, I have here a table in which you can calculate how much is your dose of radiation. So that's a computation of an individual's yearly effective dose. I want you to go over uh, the different uh, sources of radiation that you can get where you live, uh, uh, how you live, uh, whether you get uh, 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 x-rays in a given year and compare it to the average, annual average dose of about 220 milliram per person per uh, year. And we'll stop at this. This chapter is uh, extremely important. Uh, we'll try to cover it more uh, uh, on Monday and uh, so that we can not just protect ourselves, but protect 
our families, our uh, friends, and uh, uh, as leaders in fields where radiation is being used, uh, you need to protect your coworkers uh, and protect uh, the population at large. And it's a, and a professional uh, uh, and ethical uh, act for us to uh, protect the uh, whole population against the sources of radiation. I'll stop sharing. I'll be available the whole afternoon uh, for anybody who has any interesting questions. <laughs>